The Lord bless you, brethren, beloved. Welcome one more time to another Bible study. It is such a privilege and a great pleasure to sit with all of us. Amen. As we together go into the word of the Lord, God is indeed a good God. And from what we have been looking at over the past few weeks, uh, the whole subject of the tabernacle and what it means, what it signifies, what it is that we can pull from it and apply to the church today, it does so much to our hearts. And we give God thanks for allowing us to look deeper into what we have today in the church as we reflect on the tabernacle and the principles of the tabernacle. We are going to be continuing our study and we are going to be moving, amen, a little bit closer now to the actual tabernacle itself, the layout of the tabernacle, the actual pattern, plan of the tabernacle, how it was uh, put together, the furniture that were used in carrying out all the functions of the tabernacle, what each of them represents, uh, what they represented then and what they represent now in terms of their symbolism and no meaning in the church. And it, it gives uh, a certainly uh, deeper look and allows for a greater experience in our walk with God simply by understanding uh, what some of these or all of these things represent. So it indeed has been and will be something that as we go through will enlighten and open our eyes and our minds. And I invite us all to take the time out and to look deep into this subject area. Now when we started, we try to indicate to us the importance, the reasons why we ought to be taking seriously the study of the tabernacle. It is really a sub-area to the broader area that the Bible study's real topic is, which is the church. But as we said, we wanted to take it from ground zero and to go right back pretty much to the beginning and see that the church was not an afterthought in the mind of Almighty God. It was actually planned and God was giving hints and showing us symbols and indicating to us from way back then in the book of Exodus that something was coming that was going to be different, that was going to, uh, because of its introduction, bring men to God in a way never before seen. And so God used the tabernacle in the wilderness as a kind of pointer, uh, indicating something that was to come that would ultimately, once and for all, bring about the salvation of mankind. Notice that in the tabernacle, all that happened, that, that process was carried through year after year, year after year. The sins of the people of Israel were atoned, but only for a year. It was rolled back and every year the same process had to be carried out. And over and over, over the years it had to be done. But it was actually pointing to something and pointing to a day back then they would not have known. But now looking in hindsight we are seeing it and the Bible has made it clear. It was pointing to the fact that a day was going to come when one high priest with one sacrifice once and for all was going to put us back in track, on track to restoration through the process of redemption. So we were going to get back to God. The relationship was going to be there. And we are going to see some things that happened then and how limited it was. But there was in the mind of God a plan that would have lasted once and for all and place us 
back into good standing with Almighty God. As we go through, we will see the tabernacle and its link with the church. And we will realize that this church that you and I are in, amen, is not something to be taken lightly. It is something that is in the heart of Almighty God. And you who are Christians, you are special. You who are Christians, you're a peculiar people. You and I who are Christians, we are a royal priesthood. We are actually called priests of God. And there is a reason for that. So as we look and examine the role of the priests in the tabernacle and we see what it is that they did, we are going to be able to put together and identify what you and I as priests also will have to do even while we are in the church in this 21st century. So I want us to take the time and I want us to go through. As we go through, this is how we, we are going to be presenting it, brothers and sisters. We'll take the time and I start out by just giving us a few more pointers. It is so important. Uh, one of the things that we can use to mark the importance importance of a subject matter in the Bible is how often it is repeated, how often it is presented and repeated, and that signals that this is something of great import. It is very, very important. Uh, when we some time ago did the study of the end times and Bible prophecy, we found out that the scriptures was, were replete with prophetical utterances, utterances of the first coming of Jesus Christ, utterances of the second coming of Jesus Christ. All of these were prophetic. And so when we did the analysis, we found that scriptures relating to prophecy took up a large percentage of the Bible. It means the subject area of prophecy is not to be taken lightly. We must take time out and understand where we are and understand what, is, what happened and what is to come. Very important. And so we see this um, applying to prophecy because of how often scriptures speak to it. Now, I use that so that we can understand that the subject of the tabernacle is a very important one. Don't underestimate the things that we are looking at. Don't underestimate the things that we will look at. The simple furniture that are laid out in the tabernacle, don't underestimate it. The veil that separate the holy place from the holy of holies, don't underestimate. All these things coming together, you might sim simply say, but that is Old Testament stuff, and let us put it behind and let us forget about it because it is all past. But it is not past. It is ex inextricably linked to what is happening in this 21st century in the church of Jesus Christ. And so it is one flow from Exodus right down to Revelation, because as we said before, you would have seen that in the book of Hebrews, it speaks about things relating to the tabernacle. And if you don't understand the tabernacle, we will not get a full grasp and understanding of the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, a part of the church. When we look in the book of Revelation, we recognize that Revelation itself speaks to things related to the sanctuary, the tabernacle. And so what we are studying, what we are looking at now, has its tentacles stretched right across the pages into the New Testament, into the time that you and I are in. If we don't establish the nexus, then we will go through and we will miss a whole lot. We will think that we are in uh, an organization or an, an organism that we know is the church. We will see it as being just another group of people coming together, similar to other groups that get together, but no, that's not it. This is it. The church of Jesus Christ is the ultimate because after the church, there is nothing else. This is the final in terms of destination before we then head to the eternal state. And so, and when I say eternal state, you know, 
in terms of finishing with this side of life after this and the rapture. While we are there, we know in terms of sequencing what will happen. There will be a, some additional time and then thereafter the Lord will come back to the earth. Then there will be a period of the millennium and then afterwards we go into the eternal state. But in terms of a body that will ultimately take us to the final resting place, whether it's going to be with God or with Satan, this is it. So we must take seriously anything that speak to the church, that explain and expand the church that you and I are a part of. And the tabernacle is doing just that. And so as we put it together, we're going to, one, we're going to give some more reasons uh, as to why it is important to study this area. Do not take it lightly. Get your pens, get your notebook, make jottings, and try to put yourself into this thing so that you can operate not as the priest of all, but as the priest in the New Testament. Kings and priests we are in the church. Are there for a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people? Never lose sight of that. These are scriptures used to describe God's people in the church age, and we are a part of that. So we are going to close off with some additional information as to why it is important to get into, to drill into, and go over and over until we get it, this subject area of the tabernacle. As I said, now we will thereafter go over to outline and give us the plan of the tabernacle. And we are going to see that everything about the tabernacle from the time when it was set up and the, uh, the tribes were lined up around it, we are going to see in lining up north, south, east, and west, they were given instructions as to where they ought to assemble themselves. We will see that the very shape of their assembly as they go north, south, east, and west and stretch themselves out, it took the form of a cross with the tabernacle right in the middle of the gathering of the people of God. Everything has significance, it appears. And we will also see that in the tabernacle itself, how the furniture are laid out, it represents nothing less than a cross. So that from back there in the book of Genesis, before people knew about crucifixion, because crucifixion by a cross did not come into existence until further down with the Romans, hundreds and hundreds of years later with the Romans. And yet, a symbol of the cross was presented in the book of Exodus just by way of how the children of Israel lined themselves and organized themselves around the tabernacle. And then within the tabernacle itself, how the furniture was set up, the form of a cross, long before anybody knew about the use of a cross for crucifixion. This is Bible. This is the tabernacle. This is prophecy. And this is God at work showing his sovereignty and that he is in charge and he knows the end from the beginning. And it therefore behoves all of us to extract what we can from this study and apply it to our lives. It is for the young saints. It is for the elderly saints. It is for all of us. It is a refresher for those who would have known it. And we are going to see some new things that we probably might have not even had known before. And so, as we look at the furniture, what we are going to do, we will show you how the thing looks. Right? When we speak about the brazen altar, for example, we will show what it looked like. But then when you read through the scriptures and we hear the Bible describing how they ought to build it, we will then show a little 3D presentation of the pieces coming together so that we have a visual of how the thing came together and how it looked and therefore how it would have carried out its particular function. And we are going to show that little 3D rendition. And then now, as each item 
each piece of furniture in the tabernacle is shown. And we see the 3D rendition. Then I'm going to go back now and start to give the explanation as to what it means and what should happen to us as we see what it meant then, how we apply it to our own lives now. So just take, we're going to take our time and you know, we have a little animation in the presentation as we show the 3D just for clarity in our minds as to how the thing look right around and so we can proceed forward and understand in a more clearer way how they all fit together and how the tabernacle experience was carried out. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to invite us as we go through now to just to finalize some additional points for our clarity and for our deeper appreciation of what this tabernacle is about. Let me invite us to look at the screen as we touch on a few points and then we pick it up from there. So we are now going to be focusing on the tabernacle in the wilderness. We, we, we are going to be looking on the tabernacle in the wilderness and we are going to pretty much see what we are seeing there is just a basic layout of how the whole thing looked right we will go into it a little bit later but brothers and sisters that layout that we are looking at with leaning right around uh, that tent that is on the inside we see two pieces of um, two items of furniture there uh, one is that first one at the front is the brazen altar. That second thing, what is what is called the brazen laver, and that is just how it is laid down, laid out. As you go in that tent, you are going to see some other things, and we are going to be showing you. So we are now going to be taking time just to get some additional information. All right, and as we do that, then we will start to appreciate more and more how the whole system works. Brothers and sisters, the command was given to build the tabernacle. The command was given to build the tabernacle. And Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 to 9, literally gives us uh, the instruction and the command coming from Exodus the Lord. chapter 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger's skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Exodus Amen, amen. So brothers and sisters, the tabernacle, and I said this earlier, is of such great importance to God's redemptive program that 50 chapters in the Bible is given to explain its pattern, construction, and its service. 50 chapters. Now, it's everything in the Bible clearly would be important. It is the Word of God, and it found its way there. But when 50 chapters is given to deal with a particular subject matter, then it simply shows and is an indication that this particular subject matter is of extreme importance. Now, as we go through, we notice that nothing was left for up to Moses. None of his ideas 
not what he felt was right. Uh, I have a particular penchant for this particular type of wood. Nothing was left up to Moses to decide. He couldn't speculate on anything. God revealed to him in minute detail every aspect of the tabernacle. And to, to kind of cement this, no, I want us to note that more than 20 times in Exodus we read, and the Lord commanded Moses. He was commanded at every step of the way. And Moses, being true to his nature and who he was, carried out the command of the Lord to the minutest of details. So the Lord gave the command. He was very specific. And Moses carried out the command of the Lord to the T. Now, we are here talking about the tabernacle, and sometimes we interchange and we use the word sanctuary. Now, there are five names in scriptures that describe the tabernacle. We note the word sanctuary, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. It describes the same tabernacle, the same tent, and it calls it a sanctuary, denoting that it was set apart for a holy God. Sanctuary, sanctify, they are the same root word. And so sanctuary means a place set apart, totally set apart uh, for a holy God. And so when the term sanctuary is used, you're talking about separation, you're talking about sanctifying, you're talking about a place set apart for God to dwell in. Then now, it is also called the tabernacle. We see this in Exodus 25, verse 9. And that term tabernacle reveal that it was the dwelling place or the dwelling of God among his people. And we have said it before that he wanted, wanted to dwell not just in the heaven and mankind was on earth and then we just look up to heaven and pray to him. No, God has always wanted to be in the midst and to be among the creation that he made. And when I talk about creation, specifically humankind, especially us as men and women. And so tabernacle revealed that it was that place where God would dwell among his people. Then thirdly, it was called a tent, Exodus 26 and verse 36. And this designated that it was a temporary dwelling place of God, right? Uh, while God dwelt in the tent and then later on in a temple made by stone, you know, and wood and so forth, these are all temporary. Ultimately, we see that God wanted to first dwell in men. He wanted to dwell in the church. And then later on, he will literally, in that eternal state to come, be dwelling amongst the people that are redeemed. He will have his throne among us. He will be with us. He will be dwelling among us. And that ultimately is where God has his plans. And this is all outlined in scripture. Then the same sanctuary is called the tabernacle of the congregation. Exodus 29 and 42 tells us this. Because it was where God met with the people, with the congregation. So it was called the tabernacle of the congregation. This was God meeting with the people, the children of Israel. And this is always what he wanted to do. And then fifthly, it was also called the tabernacle of testimony, Exodus 38 and verse 21. And when it talks about testimony, it describes that covenant given to Moses. You will recall that the testimony, you will recall that the testimony is speaking to that covenant, the Ten Commandments. And as we do the study later on, we are going to find that this covenant this testimony was literally placed in the Ark of the Covenant for posterity. It was there. So the tabernacle of testimony 
uh, speaks to the fact that he's a covenant God and we need, amen, to understand this. Now, the, the structure and service showed a sinful people how they could come before a holy God in worship and service. So God set up the tab tabernacle with all the things that would follow in it so that we could understand as a people how, and of course, this is talking about the people of Israel back then, but then it has lessons for us, for us today, and we will reach there in a little while. But it was basically there to show how a sinful people, who were the children of Israel, could, through the means and the method that God set up, how they could come before a holy God in worship and service, and offer sacrifice for sin, and then receive instruction and counsel from God as to how, yes, his redemption plan would have worked out for his people. So everything about the structure and all that happened in the tabernacle, the service, everything was pointing and showing how we could come before a the presence of a holy God, even though they had erred and they had sinned and they have gone against the word and the counsel of Almighty God, he provided a way and this was shown to the people of God then through the establishment and the work of the tabernacle. Now I want us to notice this. I made reference to it just a short while ago and I want us to notice this. Only two chapters of the Bible are devoted to a description of the creation of the world, the creation of mankind. Two chapters are devoted to creation. Now imagine the sins of God, creation, the heavens, the earth, look at the mountains, look at the seas, look at everything. My, they talk about the seven seas, you have the, the, the Indian Ocean and you have the, the Pacific and you have the Mediterranean and you have them all. Just look around the world at the things that we see and the mountains and the hills and, and look at the, 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 the ice areas. Look at everything that we can see and imagine in the world that we now know. And it was set up by Almighty God. Look at the trees, look at the animals, look at all the things that we see. And look at humankind, the pearl of God's creation. And that was all summed up, brothers and sisters, in two chapters in the Bible. Yet, this thing about the tabernacle that you and I are looking at now, 50 chapters was given, was designated to and devoted to describe it and all the related ministries. That is very significant, brothers and sisters, and it is important that we see this point. So 50 chapters give us everything about creation and man, humankind coming on the earth with all the animals and everything, two chapters, and yet 50 is given to the subject of the tabernacle and its related ministries, and these have to do with redemption. Brothers and sisters, it is most important. So just to, to sum it up and to give us some reasons, additional reasons, as to why we must study and understand the tabernacle and its ministries, I've listed a few pointers here. One, a study of the tabernacle is necessary for a proper understanding of God's redemptive program, which is progressively revealed in Scripture. Very important. If we study the tabernacle, we will be in a position to better understand God's redemptive program. And it is Almighty God, you will recall in the book of Genesis, as early as Genesis chapter 3, God was making promise that someone was coming 
who was going to crush the serpent's head. The serpent would have bruised his heel, but he was going to crush the head of the, serp the serpent. And this is coming all the way from Genesis chapter 3 and about verse 15. And so from Genesis all the way down, God has been progressively revealing in scriptures his redemptive program. And it was in the study of the tabernacle that we see it coming to fore in a marked way, in a powerful way that indicated exactly how it was going to be effected. All right. So that's the first point. It was necessary so that we can understand God's redemptive program. Two, an understanding of the tabernacle informs us about the holiness <coughs> of, all, sorry, of Almighty God. And this is extremely, extremely important. We see as we go through all that is happening in the tabernacle that God was just set apart. He was just different. He was just in a plane by himself. And all those that had to do with the ministry in the sanctuary, they had to prepare themselves and to set themselves apart also. So as we understand the holiness of God and see God being who he is, it teaches us something about how we too must see God in the church and therefore how we must see ourselves because he is no less a holy God in the sanctuary called the church today as he was in the tabernacle back there in the book of Exodus. And so these are significant things that we must not lose sight of. Number three, a knowledge of the tabernacle is foundational to an understanding of Christ's fulfillment of God's redemptive program. So that if we understand the tabernacle, it allows us to understand what really Jesus did when he died on Calvary. We just hear about, many of us just read about it and we say, yes, Jesus died for me. And we are unable to map that against anything else. So what he died for me, why it had to be crucifixion? I mean, once he died, he died. And we can't relate it to anything. We, we can't relate it to anything because... We just cannot see the linkage. But I want us to understand if we get into this tabernacle and appreciate what happened there and what it really means, then we are going to appreciate more than anything else the work that Jesus Christ did on Calvary in fulfilling redemption for humankind. And that is extremely, extremely important. Now, point number four shows us, as we get into the tabernacle, point number four shows us the tabernacle literally demonstrates, shows us our holy God can manifest his grace and his mercy to sinful people. Now we all know that God in his holiness, and we have when we look at how God operated in the past, you know, and in the earth, once God turned up, men would just die, left. Once sin presents itself, you can't, you're, you're out of it, you're gone, you're wiped out, you're totally gone. But as we go through the tabernacle, we see that God Himself, through the different stages, is showing that he has set up a system so that as holy as he is and as sinful as we are, there can be a coming together. There can be a merging of a righteous holy God with a sinful people who wants God and who God wants. And that tabernacle demonstrates how that coming together takes place. And that is extremely extremely important. Then the tabernacle, the priestly ministry in the tabernacle reveals how sinful people can approach a holy God with acceptable worship. <coughs> Sorry. So back there, even in worship, we had to approach God a certain way. You would see that there are some steps. There are some steps that the priests made before they could go in 
and reach up to that altar of incense where they offer up incense to God, which became a sweet-smelling savor. For that to happen, some things had to be in place so that God would accept the worship of sinful men. And what it showed then is indicative of what is happening today. And I'm suggesting to us, brothers and sisters, that today, men, even though we are sinful, we can fix that through what God has provided and we can find that way of approach to the presence of a holy God. And this is shown in the tabernacle and we will see how it is applied to us today. Then the study of the priesthood is foundational to an understanding of Christ's priestly ministry and also our ministry as priests of God. And that is very, very important. All right, I just mentioned point seven, understanding the function of Israel's priesthood enables Christians to have a greater appreciation of their own role as believer priests because we are priests. And so we can start to see now how all that happened then has a direct bearing on our lives. And this is extremely important for us to catch. And then finally, a proper understanding of the Levitical sacrifices gives Christians a greater understanding of God's view of sin in the Old Testament. All right? Now, follow this. His view of sin is no less in the New Testament. In other words, by looking at all that transpired back there with the Levitical sacrifices, and we are seeing how God abhors sin and demands that certain thing back there be done before they could go through the process of coming into his presence. It is the same way today as Christians in the church, in the Christian church, because of the fact that he views sin no less than he did back there, then we ought to be careful that we understand what is required of us in the New Testament church, which is the real deal, which is the real building. All that we saw back there in the tabernacle were just types, were just shadow of what was to come. The real thing is what we are literally experiencing today. And if that kind of service and ministry was demanded back there in the tabernacle, which was just the shadow, then imagine what is required of us now that the real substance, the substantive thing is here with us in the New Testament church. So brothers and sisters, we have to, we must take time out to recognize and understand how God views sin, how we treated it, what he required of the Levitical sacrifices, and then look over to where we are. All of that was under a system which was just the shadow of the real thing to come. We need to now understand that now that the real thing is here, this thing requires so much of us. Of course, we have the Holy Ghost, and therefore we are empowered to do and to execute what is required. But understand that God requires, as he did then, he's demanding and requiring it now, that we move with a certain level of alacrity or, or, or swiftness. We move with a certain level of meaningfulness. Whatever it is that we are doing to God, look at how the Levites, the Levitical priests, uh, carried out their function. Look at the consistency. Look at the dedication. Look at the discipline. So much for us to learn. And so we are going through so that indeed we can learn and we can um, move and be the kind of people that God wants us, <coughs> I'm sorry, that God wants us to be. Now, we are going to go into the pattern of the tabernacle, and that is extremely important. The Lord provided the pattern. Uh, 
And Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9 uh, gives us that God spoke and God said, this is how I want the thing to be set. This is how I want the thing to stay. And notice that having said how he wanted the thing to be designed, <clears throat> the, the kind of furniture, how it was to be built, what material was to be used, the, the kind of cloth, the linen, the color, and all the different things God outlined in Exodus 25 and verse 9 speaks to the pattern. And then notice, while the Lord provided the pattern, it was the people that provided the material. We see this in Exodus 25 verses 2 to 7. And what were some of the things that the people had to offer? The, the offerings were gold, brass, silver, jewels, fine linen, and dye. Where did they get these things from? From Egypt. Goats here, ram skin. Going to, they got these things from Egypt. And of course, the shittim wood, uh, which is the acacia wood, it came from out in the Sinai desert. And so all the things that were required to build the tabernacle, the people had it. God provided it for them. When they were leaving, when they were leaving the land of Egypt, God told them, I'm going to <clears throat> have you to spoil the Egyptians. And of course, they took from them. They were free for 400 and odd years, brothers and sisters. And we know all of that. And you see, God is just. And it doesn't matter. The key thing is for us to serve God and serve him with a willing and a perfect heart. Man might think they are taking advantage of you and they are going to extract everything from you and enlarge themselves and enlarge their borders and, and become fat on your sweat and your tears. And that might very well happen. But I want us to understand, brothers and sisters, that God, he has his pen and he makes his note. And when God is ready to deliver you and takes you out of a situation, you're not coming out empty-handed and he has a plan for you, whichever way he's going to do it, he's going to ensure that you are paid for every sacrifice that you make. God will never be a debtor to any man. And even we who are walking with him here on earth in our Christian walk, understand that a day will come when God is going to reward us when we get over yonder. I want us to understand that no good work that we do with a true heart coming from the deep recesses of our souls is going to be unrewarded. And therefore, it behoves us to understand this. And this is exactly what happened back there even before the tabernacle was built. They left Egypt and God allowed them to spoil the Egyptians. And they left with gold and they left with silver and they left with brass and they left with jewels and they, they, they left with all the things. And then notice now, God in Exodus 25 verses 2 to 7 required that they give from what he gave them. Follow the principle. Give from what he gave them. Because when they left, they had nothing. While they were there, they had nothing. And when they left, it was God that hit the heart of the Egyptians. So that when the people went in and said, give me this, give me this, they gladly gave it to them and said, take this and go on, take this and go on. That was God rewarding his people, Israel, for what they did over 400 years. That was a lot of wealth that they left. Chances are they left Egypt broke. All right, so we need to understand that. And so when it was time for them to build that tabernacle for God, everything that was needed was in the camp of Israel. Today, God desires that his people give themselves first to his service. Romans 12 verse 1, speak to us about that. And then we bring our gifts willingly, amen, to take care of the work of the Lord. So the process of giving ourselves to God as what happened in the tabernacle back there is still active and alive today. 
and in the process of giving willingly. Because as we go on, we are going to see that when God asks the people to come in and to give, to build the tabernacle, he said, look here, take it only from those that decide that they are going to give willingly. And Romans 12 and verse 1 speaks to the church today in terms of how we must give and, you know, give willingly. So, I'm not going to say much about this yet, but I will come back to this. But looking on this slide, do we get what image comes to our mind just looking at this slide? we see, no doubt, an image that looks like a cross. See that straight piece going out and then the, the cross going across? All right, that looks like a cross. Brothers and sisters, you might not know, but this is pretty much how the children of Israel was lined out, laid out when they were camping and they were going, to, when they were going through the wilderness and they are going to have to stop now. When the cloud would indicate to them, this is where you must stop, everybody stopped. And when they stopped, they all gathered. Some gathered to the east, some gathered to the west, some gathered to the north, and some gathered to the south. And the instructions that God gave them in terms of who must gather where, who must gather to the north, who must gather to the south, the instructions were that they were, they were to the north, three tribes. Dan, Asher, Naphtali, they were gathered together. Those three were gathered to the north. Then to the south, another three tribe, Simeon, Reuben, and Gad. And these three tribes were gathered to the south based on the instruction from the word of the Lord. Then now, to the east, three more tribes were gathered. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulon. And of course, to the west, another three tribes were gathered. Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Now, based on the, so all, all of these three tribes to each of the points, north, south, east, and west, three tribes for each of them, we get all 12 tribes in order around the poles. North, as we said before, Asher, Dan, Naphtali. South, Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. East, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon. And west, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Now, it would appear that if they gathered around in trees like that, in, in batches of threes like that, then you would say a square. But what, we did, what most folks don't realize is that on the east, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, they had much more in terms of numbers than any of the other tribes. So when we look at these three, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, and we look at the numbers, they, at the time, in terms of men, numbered 186,400. And to the opposite side of them, on the west, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, they had only 108,000. So we will find that to the side which is westward, 108,000 folks are there. But the opposite side of it, which is eastward, 186,000. So that we are going to see that right in the center where the tabernacle is. Right in the center where the tabernacle is. Right in the center. We're trying to see if I can just get a... Uh, this is where the tabernacle is located. That center. That's where the tabernacle is located. And if we look, Judah... Issachar, Zebulon, 186,000. You see how long that side is. Yet on the other side, it's only 108,000. All right? 
So we get a longer section there. East to west. We get that long section. So that, just looking at it, we see how they are set out. Now when we go the other side now, when we go the other side now, which is north to south, we see that in total, on the north side, which is Dan, Asher, and Naphtali, 157,000. And then on the south side, which is Simeon, Reuben, and Gad, 151,000. So that when we look at the shape of it, brothers and sisters, right in the center, you have the camp, or the tabernacle, sorry, and then right around it with the tribes laid out as possible. If you go up into the mountain and look down on it, which is what the perspective that we have there now, you realize what we are seeing there? It is the shape of a cross. And it didn't, it didn't seem as much at the time. But looking now from our perspective and going back, we are seeing something that even in how God instructed his people to lay themselves out around the tabernacle. The tabernacle is at the center and they all gathered around it. But the gathering around it was in the form of a cross. So that from back there in the setup, not even going into the temple, the actual tabernacle as yet, but just the arrangement, the pattern of that arrangement is such that we are seeing a cross way back from before, <coughs> sorry, a cross was established. And this is extremely important, saints of God. We can easily see that God knew from then, the very beginning, this was not an afterthought. This was not an afterthought. This literally was God understanding what was happening. So what I'm showing you here is what I just described to you so that you could see the form of a cross. All right? And that is coming from, that is literally coming from way back then. God had in mind, it was said as I indicated earlier on in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that someone was coming and he was going to bruise, that is Satan was going to bruise his heel, that servant that was coming, Messiah, the Prince Christ who was coming, Satan was going to bruise his heel, which happened on the cross when he was crucified, but then up from the grave he arose and he crushed Satan's head. And my God, God was showing us right there from the early days that see that cross signal, something was coming, watch out for it. And so we learned about at least the pattern of the cross just from seeing how they were laid out around the tabernacle back there. Now, the entire embankment, the entire area to include the outer court and the entire setup was 150 feet long. You're talking about the fence on the outside. 150 feet long. And it was 75 feet wide. Right? So the length was 150. And then at the front, the width, it was 75 feet across. All right? And this is pretty much the overall size of the entire structural arrangement. Right, the linen curtain was held in place by 60 pillars made of acacia wood covered with bronze. And of course, each pillar was 7.5 feet across. Remember now, all of this was set up based on instructions that Moses received from Almighty God. So I'm just giving you a little bit of background there as to how the thing was set up. Now, if I might take us back to the first slide where we started, I, I'm going to just take us back there, and then from there now, I am going to 
having sh looked at something, I'm going to go right into some of the furniture so that we can get a good understanding of how they are. But let me just go back to the first slide that shows the basic layout of all of these furniture. We had the brazen altar. We had what is called the brazen laver. We had all of these things. And I just wanted to literally to show us how the thing was laid out. And having done that, I want us to then look at each piece of furniture bit by bit. So this showed the encampment, the entire area. We just said 150 feet long, 75 feet wide. One, right? 150 feet long, right down the length. And then that front area where the gate is at, it is 75 feet wide. Now, as we look inside, we see a big box. In fact, that, that, is, that big box is the, what is called the brazen altar. Right. That's the brazen altar. And that's the first piece of furniture, the first item of furniture that one will meet upon when they come through the gate. All right? And that gate is 30 feet wide. Right? So there is a gate at the front, and it is 30 feet wide. And it is very important that we, yeah, we can see that and understand that. It's a wide gate, and it takes you right in. As you go through that gate... And look in, the first item that we see is the brazen altar. Then, so I'm just telling us the, the items, and then later on now we will get into what these things represent. Then the next item of furniture that we see is what is called the brazen laver. All right, once we are through there, the priest would then go into that curtain, if you look beyond that lever, that curtain, there's a curtain there. And the priest would go to that curtain and go through and go inside that curtain. Now, when he is there, when he is there at that and goes through that door, he is going to meet upon three items of furniture. One, the table of what is called the table of showbread. And we will look at it. I'm just telling you what is inside now. And we will, in a little while, get to these particular pieces of furniture. He's going to meet upon the table of showbread. Then he's going to meet upon the seven lampstands. And also he's going to meet upon what is called the altar of incense. And those are not shown just now because they are inside of that tent. But we will see it, you know, opened up in a little while. So I'm just telling us what is there so that as we start to look at each individual item, we will appreciate what they represent. And then finally, there is one more tent. This is called a veil on the inside, which you're not seeing now. And beyond that veil is the last piece of furniture, which is called the... the Exodus chapter 25. Ark of the And the Lord's... So I just want us to speak unto Moses, thing, saying, so that we Speak can unto the children of Israel. Now, and I want us to look, when you go through that tent door... You go inside, as you go through that tent door, and this is the, the priest himself is going to do that. When he goes inside, he's going to meet upon three items of furniture. One, the table of showbread. I just mentioned, good. And to the other side, the, we have the candle or the lampstand. That's right. So these are things that are inside. And then just before the veil, there is another piece of furniture right there. That is called the altar of incense. So these are the three things that are inside that section of the tabernacle, which is called the holy place. So where we started out and we saw 
the altar, the brazen altar, and the brazen lever, that section outside is called the outer court. <coughs> the outer court. So I'm just giving us the basic layout so that we can just to see what the tent is all about. And then once in that outer court, that is where the people and how far they could have gone, none of them could go beyond the outer court where that brazen altar was. They would come into the outer court and they would offer up their sacrifice and they'll hand it to the priest and the priest would drain the blood and he did all that he had to do and then the priest would move on and ultimately he would come through that tent door and go inside the holy place and once inside there he sees three items of furniture the table of showbread as we just pointed out the candle stand or the lampstand with its seven candlesticks and then in front of them is the altar of incense and then once that is seen and all that is to be done is done at these places then the high priest is the only one now that goes into the next chamber which is what is called the holy of holies so he's going to go through a veil that is there and once he goes through that veil, he is in the Holy of Holies. And in there resides the Ark of the Covenant. That little box there. In there resides the Ark of the Covenant. This is where the very presence of God, this is where God chose to concentrate his presence. And above that, stood the Shekinah presence of Almighty God. But to get there, they had to go through a process. And God is the one that established that process, that having come through the gate in the outer court, then you first had to come by way of the altar, the brazen altar. And there you had to sacrifice that offering. And that brazen altar speaks to repentance, true repentance, where we are sacrificing ourselves and offering up ourselves to Almighty God. Then they move from that brazen altar where the sacrifice which symbolizes and signifies repentance and then comes over to the brazen laver. And we showed them earlier on. And at the brazen laver, the priest was commanded to wash lest he died. He had to wash his hands and he had to wash his feet. And this was, of course, symbolic. Because when we are coming into the presence of God in the saints of the Most High God, we must be clean on the inside and we must be clean on the outside. And I want us to understand that principle. So this is exactly what happened to the priest. And the priest would then move from there, go through the tent door, and then do what he had to do on the inside. And then once a year... The high priest would go through the veil on the day of atonement only once a year and he would go into, through that veil into that most holy chamber wherein lied the Ark of the Covenant and right at the top of it in what is called the mercy seat that Shekinah presence of God would be there blazing and you would be surprised saints of God how serious that high priest took that job because he knows that he's going into the very presence of a holy God first on behalf of himself and on behalf of the people and it is said that there were priests who were not properly who were not ready to go in the presence of almighty God and because of the lack of preparation and the lack of diligence they had to I, I am not sure, but history has it that they actually had to tie a cord on the feet or on one of the foot, on one foot of the priest. Should in case he's struck dead, nobody could go in there to take him out. He had to be drawn out. So I, I have heard that, not sure how, how that is, but that is one of the things that the Hebrew tradition has. That, that is how they had to treat that high priest because the presence of God was not a place to go 
if you're not ready. It's not a place to go and to skylark. And it's not a presence to trifle with. And so this is how the sequence of things would go. So we are going to go back now and look at the first item of furniture in this entire established layout. And it is the brazen altar. And we are seeing it there. And Exodus chapter 27 verses 1 to 8 kind of gives us or gives us the layout of this thing. I want us to get a, 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 a better feel for it. So I, uh, we are going to just show us a little 3D animation of how this thing came together based on the word of the Lord given in Exodus 27 verses 1 to 8. So just taking the, the presentation, saints of God, and just see how the thing comes together in terms of what God instructed, amen, in Exodus 28, and understand. You should make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square. Its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. Also you should make its pans to receive its ashes, and its shovels, and its basins, and its forks, and its fire pans. You should make all its utensils of bronze. You should make a grate for it, a network of bronze, and on the network you should make four bronze rings at its four corners. You should put it under the rim of the altar beneath, that the network may be midway up the altar. And you should make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood and overlay them with bronze. The pole shall be put in the rings and the pole shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it. You shall make it hollow with boards as it was shown you on the mountain, so shall they make it. All right, so we are seeing exactly how the thing came together and how God gave the instruction and the brazen altar was established. You know, slowly, the Israelites reverently, and we are looking at the structure of the altar and its significance. And the Israelites reverently approached the tabernacle. As they came in, they drew back the curtain and entered its court to present their sacrifices. Upon entering the court, and this is the outer court that we just made mention of, they stood in awe, gazing at the bloodstained altar as the smoke from the previous sacrifices went up into the sky. The altar was a very simple hollow box made of shittim wood or acacia wood. And then this now was overlaid with brass, as you would have heard in the scripture, seven and a half feet square. And it stood four and a half feet high, and it had four arms pointing outward at each corner. A brass grate extended through its middle, and we see all of those things that we heard them in scriptures. It was the largest piece of furniture used in worship and was always open to guilty Israelites so they could atone for their sin. For Christians, the altar, this brazen altar, is full of symbolic meaning and spiritual teaching. Now, follow this now. Shittim wood, or acacia wood, is a hard, incorruptible, indestructible wood that grows in the Sinai desert. It beautifully portrays the humanity of Jesus Christ, who came from a root out of a dry ground, according to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2, and was sinless in his human nature. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, and also in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. The indestructibility 
of the wood speaks of Christ in his humanity, which restored the fire of crucifixion and the decaying effect of the grave and his body, which was victoriously resurrected. The brass covering over the shitting wood typified that the divine righteousness and judgment of Christ, the righteous one, according to verse 1 John 3 and verse 5, who took the divine judgment of God upon himself and bore our judgment on the cross by becoming sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. As the Israelites were saved from death when they looked at the brass, brass serpent in the wilderness, you remember that brass serpent that Moses made and held up in the wilderness? It is the same way all of us who trust in Jesus Christ, who was lifted up on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, this is how we are going to be saved from damnation. So that Christ's appearance to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos with his feet like fine brass or bronze as it were burned in a furnace. It spoke of his judicial character in judging his enemies at his second coming. So this is very significant. The structure of the altar and its significance, very significant. Now, the second bullet point that is here speaks to the sacrifice at the altar and its significance. Now, the brazen altar was provided for sacrifice, as we heard from the scripture that was read. Without sacrifice, there could be no atonement for sin. And we know this from Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. We know this from Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 20, 22. Soberly, the Israelites brought the priesthood offering without spot or blemish to the priests who stood at the tabernacle gate to receive them. The offerers, so those folks that came and brought their sacrifice, they laid their hands on the head of the offerings, symbolic of their identification with their substitutionary death on their behalf. Their sins, and this is all symbolic, their sins were transferred to the sacrifices. And then the life of the sacrifices was transferred to them. So the people transferred their sin to a, an animal that they brought. That animal who did nothing transferred his life to the people. And this was all symbolic. And then the offerers then killed, which is the priest, killed the animals. Or the people who brought the animals killed the animals. While the priests would then catch the sacrificial blood in a basin and then offered it as an atonement so that the priests functioning as mediators now took that blood, sprinkled the blood of the sacrifices on the altar and poured the remaining blood in the basin at the altar's base or at the base of the altar. Then the priest would cut the sacrifices into pieces, wash the inner parts, and then burn the other pieces on the altar as a sweet-smelling savor to the Lord. The word altar, brethren, means high place. The sacrifice had to be lifted up on the altar, which was kind of elevated. You probably didn't see it in the picture, but they had built a little ramp and they placed the altar, uh, that brazen altar on that ramp so that the sacrifices had to be lifted up on an elevated altar. Look at Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 22 tells us about that. And this is speaking to Christ being lifted up on the cross as our sacrifice 
and it speaks to that per procedure. And then there's another scripture in St. John chapter 3 and verse 14 that tells us, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that the fire that burned continually on the altar had a twofold meaning. It proclaimed Christ, God's holiness and justice, and it was symbolic of his readiness to receive the sacrificial offering of the people to cleanse them from sin. And so we look at the structure of the altar and its significance, then the sacrifice at the altar and its significance. So we are quickly going to look now at the serving utensils at the altar and their significance. There were five utensils used to serve at the altar. Right? And the five utensils used to serve were types of Christ. You had the pans and the shovels. And they were used to remove the precious ashes of the sacrifices and carry them outside the camp to be disposed of in a clean place. The ashes spoke of the finished work of Christ, St. John 19 and verse 30, who was put into a clean place, a new sepulchre, at his burial. Then now, the blood from the sacrifices were drained into a basin and poured out at the base of the altar, typifying Jesus Christ who poured out his blood on our behalf. All right? The flesh hooks represents the cruel hands of the men who nailed Jesus to the cross. We see that in St. Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. And then now the fire pan or the censers which carried the fire from the brazen altar to the altar of incense. It represented Christ's intercessory ministry of prayer at the Father's throne. He is our advocate and he is our high priest. And then finally now, the salvation that the altar symbolized is very, very important. The brazen altar and the cross of Christ both speak to justification. Justification does not mean made righteous, but declared righteous. And it put us into a right relationship with God. Thus, justification is a judicial act of God whereby he declares us righteous when we trust in Jesus Christ's work on the cross on our behalf. So what Jesus did there on the cross was reflected coming way back there on the brazen altar. It symbolized our repentance. It symbolized our moving to salvation. We must first come to the cross, to the brazen altar. And at that altar, we repent, we pour it out, we make our sacrifice, and we move on to salvation. Jesus made this possible for us when at the altar of the cross, he made that supreme sacrifice that opened the door to salvation. And what was there back in that first piece of furniture, the brazen altar, we repenting, we off make offering our sacrifice, we see further in the New Testament time that that sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary did a major work in opening the door so that we could come and move to draw closer to Almighty God. And so this is just the, the, the introduction, the beginning of what happened with the, at the brazen altar. So we are going to now move to the next piece of furniture, which is the brazen laver. 
All right? The scripture, it's, it looks somewhat like that. It is not given any dimension of all the furniture that were there. This brazen lever, there were no dimensions given to it. So we are not extremely clear just how big or how small it was, but no dimension was given to this particular piece of equipment. And that is significant by itself. But let us take a 3D look at it and let us hear the instructions from Exodus 30, verses 30 to 20, verses 17 to 20, and appreciate what we have here. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze, for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die, and it shall be a statute for ever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Amen. Amen. So we are looking at the brazen laver, and we are seeing four points that are very important to understanding the strategic position of the labor, the sanctifying provision of the labor, the servant's purification by the Lord, and the servant's privilege before the Lord. All of these things jump at us by just looking at the brazen labor. Let us look at the strategic position of the labor. The priests themselves knew very well the strategic placement and symbolic meaning of the laver. Their sins being atoned for at the brazen altar made it possible for them to approach the tabernacle in worship, but not before they stopped at the brazen laver to wash the defilement of the dusty tabernacle court from their bodies. They had to be both spiritually and physically clean before they could enter into the presence of a holy God in communion and fellowship. The word of God was clear on this matter. Ye shall be holy, for I am holy, which is Leviticus 11 and verse 44. The brazen laver stood in the outer court between the brazen altar and the tabernacle itself. Right? It had two parts, the circular brass bowl made from the polished brass mirrors that the woman brought with them from Egypt, and it had the brass foot or pedestal, according to Exodus 38 and verse 8. Although, and we just said it, the size of the labor is, labor is not given, it had to be big enough to hold a large amount of water used exclusively by the priests for purification. Fresh spring water coming was poured continually into the laver for daily purification. The laver had no measurements, right? And we said that a while ago. And this was symbolic of the limitless cleansing power of Almighty God. Brothers and sisters, you would be surprised at the things that we can extract from here. Notice that we said earlier that they had to wash before they, after they left the brazen altar, on their way to go into the tent, they had to stop by the brazen laver and they had to wash. So that although they had started the work already and inside their minds were set and ready and ready to go in to meet the Lord, they had to stop at the brazen laver and wash physically now their hands and their feet. So it was both an inside work and an outside work. And they had to wash and make sure that they wash because the scripture that we made reference to and that we read earlier said, the priest must wash lest ye die. So that if you come by way of the brazen altar, 
and say, okay, I have repented. I have made my sacrifice. I am going now into the presence of God. And you dare to go through the tent door and did not stop by the brazen lever and wash. This brazen lever is symbolic also of baptism. Because in the tabernacle, we also we learn of the plan of salvation. The brazen altar is where we repent. The brazen lever is where we now come and we get baptized. And notice that the priest could not bypass the brazen lever and go wash lest ye die. So that we must understand that God set the pattern here, not Moses. God, Moses just executed and God set the pattern. The brazen altar, then the brazen lever, then we go in through the tent door to go on to other things as we draw close to the presence of the Lord. So be very careful. So that brazen lever was at a strategic position. Do not bypass it. Now we also look at the second point which the brazen lever spoke to the sanctifying provision. What does this mean? The lever was used also by the priest for purification. We are also called a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Therefore we can offer spiritual sacrifices and praise that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. All of this can only be possible, saints of God, as we go through the process of purification. Having passed the brazen altar, we now stop at the brazen laver. And when we wash, we are purified. Notice Acts 2.38 tells us, repent. And then it goes on to say, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. The removal of the sins. The washing away of your sins. If you look at other scriptures, it speaks to that. And that is very important. So that the brazen labor also is used by the priest for purification. And we are seeing that our applying ourselves to being washed by water. Another scripture in the book of Acts tells us, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Folks would tell us that these things are unimportant today. But if we look at the tabernacle and its layout, we find that the plan of salvation also follows a certain pattern. And the labor is important. We cannot go into the sanctuary in the tabernacle itself. We cannot go through that tabernacle door unless we come by way first of the brazen altar and by way of the brazen lever. Wash lest ye die. And that is extremely important. And let me just jump in the interest of time to the servant's privilege before the Lord. As believers, priests, or as a believer priest, we have been justified and sanctified. You know, we who are justified and sanctified, we are now ready to offer worship and service to the Lord. So when we come through the brazen altar and when we come by way of the brazen labor, the sacrifice, the repentance, then the purification as we wash and water baptism, we are now in a position where we are ready to offer up through, through worship and service to the Lord. And so the greatest privilege of all is to have direct access into the presence of God. But to get that access, brothers and sisters, we must come by way of the altar and the labor, and then we start to draw closer and closer to God. The priests, being cleansed for service, were prepared to enter the holy place for communion with a holy God. And in the holy place, we see that we have three furniture pieces of furniture that are there. The candlesticks, which is the lampstand, the table of shoe bread, and the altar of incense. So after that preliminary, that earlier experience at the brazen 
altar. And then that next experience at the brazen laver, we are now moving into that place where we can now fellowship in a different way with Almighty God. And we are seeing that the priests are now preparing to enter the holy place for communion with a holy God. We who are cleansed in our walk before God are prepared to do the same thing. Now David summed up the believers standing before the Lord very clearly you know, when he wrote, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? This is the holy place inside of the tabernacle. Now, you know, where we move from the outer court. Who is going to stand in the holy place? That holy place is where the candlesticks are, where the table of shoe bread is, where the altar of incense is. And David then answered the question, he who has clean hands. This is the clean hands that are washed at the laver where the priests were commanded to wash their hands and to wash their feet, lest you die. And when that is done, there is an inner working that started from you came to the altar, and there is an outer work that is completed when you wash physically at the laver. And he said, he who hath clean hands and a pure heart, we who have been cleansed by the washing of the water, by the word of God, we kind of start to see some things coming together. So brothers and sisters, we must respond to the Lord's admonition. But as he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of life, in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. And so, brothers and sisters, we are ready. We as people of God, have a privilege to come before the Lord once we would have come by way of the altar and come by way of the labor, then the next step is for us to receive the Holy Ghost or to come into the presence of the Lord. God baptizes us with his presence. We now go into the presence of the Lord. We come through the curtains into the holy place and then all of a sudden we are able to function, to minister in a new and special way. And having come into the holy place, having had that experience and coming through that door, having received the Spirit of God now and coming through that door, the priest meets upon some lovely items, some lovely furniture right in that room. He meets upon the golden lampstand and then later on, to his other side, he meets upon the table of shoe bread and directly in front of him, he meets upon the brazen or the altar of incense, sorry. And so these things, he comes into the Holy of Holies and he sees these things in front of him. What does these things symbolize? What is happening here? Let us look. I see the time is almost upon us. But let us at least jump on the golden lampstand to see what is happening here. And this is the shape of it. This is how it looked based on the instructions given by Almighty God in Exodus 25 uh, verses 31 to 40. Let us quickly look at the 3D rendition and then we go right into some other words. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shafts, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with an ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, 
and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be of one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. And it shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Amen. Amen. And so the lampstand and Christ. Brothers and sisters, the lampstand was filled with rich symbolic teaching for Christians. The gold in the lampstand typifies the deity of Christ. The, and the one who stepped across the galaxies of the universe and became a man. The almighty God who became man. And he was pure in his humanity, having neither spot nor blemish. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 tells us this. But it was his deity that sustained his humanity. And it is very important for us to understand that the lampstand, as we have already seen, was not molded or pieced together, but was hammered out of a solid piece of gold. Exodus 25 and verse 31 tells us that. And symbolizing the Lord who endured the harsh, hot sting of a biting whip before his crucifixion. Isaiah wrote concerning his suffering, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 54, 53 verses 4 to 5. So contemplate the stripes of the Lord and you will love him. You will love him and your love for him will become even deeper. Now the dimension of the lampstands are not given, but its size, weight, and beauty portray Christ in his fathomless greatness. So although, again, this is another item where no dimensions are given, but in order for it to show the light and so forth, its size and its weight and its beauty portray Christ in his fathomless greatness. He is the creator of all things, and by him all things are held together. He is limitless in his value, for in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge to be found. Right? Colossians 2 verse 3. Paul summed up the greatness of Christ when he wrote, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the body of the Godhead Bodily, Colossians 2, verse 9. So, Lampstand's purpose was to provide light. It was a beautiful type of Jesus Christ, who is the true light of the world. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. St. John 8 and verse 12. The light of life that Jesus spoke of can be made, can be obtained, <clears throat> sorry, only through faith in his atoning work on the cross. But Jesus made it abundantly clear. He made it very clear that the world in, gen in general would not come to him as the light of life. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so, brothers and sisters, the light in the holy place was symbolic of Christ's holiness also. John wrote, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 verse 5. The glory of our Lord will also illuminate the new Jerusalem in eternity. 
and the city have no need of the sun, according to Revelation 21 verse 23, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the lamp of it. Christians will enjoy the great privilege of walking in the glory of Christ's light throughout all eternity. What a blessed hope. What a blessed thing. So that's the lampstand and Christ. Now the lampstand and its relation to Christians. The golden lampstand typifies Christ who lights up the walk and fellowship of believers. The holy place had no windows to allow light to shine into the tabernacle. The light in the holy place was hidden from the world. Only the priests had the privilege of ministering and enjoying the light of the lampstand. So it is with the Christian. As believer priests, we are able to enter into the light of the fellowship and communion with God. John, who knew intimate fellowship with the Lord, wrote, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Today, Christians are the only reflectors of Christ's light to a lost and dying world. Too often the light of believers shines dimly, but it is hidden under a bushel. Because it is hidden under a bushel. Believers' lamps are to beam brightly as a lighted city standing on a hill whose glow can be seen for miles around. So, brethren, beloved, as Christians, we need to see the connection between the lampstand and us as Christians. And as light, the light from the lampstand inside of us shines in us, we ought to allow for that light to be reflected to the people around us so that they can see the good work, amen, and glorify our Father which is in heaven. The gold in the lampstand pictures the true faith that Christians possess. Jesus told the Laodicean church, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. That's Revelation 3 and verse 18. Christ who is the pure, who is the pure gold produces true faith in believers. Yes, Christians go through the hammering experience of suffering to try their faith so that it will come forth as gold tried in the fire. This type of faith is much more precious than of gold that perisheth. And Peter talked about this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. So the golden lampstand was also a type of the church. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the church is portrayed as a golden lampstand. Christ is the light of each lampstand and is to shine brightly through each of these local assemblies into the dark world of sin. Jesus warned the Ephesian church who had lost its first love for him, repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy lampstand or thy candlestick out of its place. And Revelation 2 and verse 5. Sad to say, the light of all seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 was removed at some point. And today, those churches do not even exist. This situation should sound a solemn warning to the churches today, to the churches of this 21st century, to take heed lest we suffer the same faith. Brothers and sisters, it is simple, and we need to understand and see the link between the lampstand and the Christian church. Do not allow the light that is inside of us to go out. That lampstand that was in the tabernacle back then, it was not supposed to go out. It was the priest's duty 
was to make sure that that lampstand or the light in that lampstand burned continually. And that is very, very important. In fact, I might just use this as the closing note for this evening. That golden lampstand was very, very symbolic, very, very important. That particular point, the lampstand and the Christian, is extremely important. And we will use this to close off for the evening. Yes, that lampstand also, as I said, represents the church. And those churches were powerful places at the time. And they were real churches that at the time that Revelation makes mention of them or made mention of them in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. All seven of them were effective. Yes, they had their flaws, they had their ups, they had their downs. Of them all, one did not receive a rebuke, but was admonished to proceed in a particular way. But at the end of the day, we found that, based on history, these churches were not around again. For whatever reason, things happened, and history has it that they were not. If we go over to Asia Minor now, which is present-day Turkey, we would not find at the place where those churches physically were a church there. I don't know if they relocated. I don't know what happened to them. But the solemn warning is that we must take heed and don't let the light in our candlesticks, in our candle stand, go out. As we look at the tabernacle and as we look at the furniture and as we look at their symbolism, let us be clear in our minds that for sure one of the symbols of the lampstand right there in that tabernacle was that it represented the light to continually burn in the church of Jesus Christ. Are you in the church today? Is your lamp still burning a solemn word something to uh, cause us to introspect is the light still there the priest had the responsibility to keep the light burning in that lampstand he had the responsibility to always ensure that the pure olive oil that was to keep it burning was always being fed into it is your oil still in your lamp? Is the lamp still burning? Is it that your life is still illuminated with the presence of the Holy Ghost? Where are you, child of the living God? Is your light burning? Have we become dull? Have we allowed for the oil to run out? Have we become so entangled with everything else that we have neglected our responsibility as, as priests of God, which responsibly, responsibility entails us keep pouring, allowing the oil to be poured into the lampstand so that it keeps glowing and give light to the room so that the other functions can be performed. Where are we? What have we become? Have we allowed the lamp to go out? Are we a beacon to others that they can see the reflection and know that indeed we are children of God? Or have we sold out? Have we watered down? Ten years from now, will we be still in our place in the house of God? Or like the seven churches in Asia, we go there now, there no more. Let us take heed. Let us understand what the tabernacle is teaching us. Let us see the application. And let us live our lives according to what is required from the word of Almighty God. God bless you. We're going to cut it for this evening. We pick up God's willing next week. And we continue along this vein. And then we do the connections or more connections later on. 
between the tabernacle and the church of Jesus Christ because they work together and we learn today from the things that were done then and it is very important that we catch this concept because the subsequent lessons that are coming in terms of the doctrines of the church we are going to have to understand that what we are going through now is going to be important to understanding those other things that are coming. So God bless you. We cut it for this evening and we pick up next week, same time, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can we just bow our heads as we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you, great God, for another opportunity to come before your presence. You are great, O oh God, and you are greatly to be praised. We thank you for the word that we shared this evening. I pray that you will help us to as individuals apply it to ourselves, apply it to our own lives, apply it to our own hearts, so that we can become stronger Christians and having done all to stand. Thank you for the word. I pray that you will bless your people tonight. I pray that you will just embrace us, that you will hold us. And in all our endeavors, God Almighty, lead us in a path of righteousness for your name's sake. Bless us together. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. God bless you, brethren, beloved. We thank you again for joining us in Bible study. And God's willing, uh, we meet next week, same time, to continue as we go through the furniture, the items of furniture in the tabernacle. Look at some things that we can extract from them. And then we try to put the pieces together. Amen. And let them fit. God bless you next week in Jesus' name. Amen.